Hi and welcome to Parshas Korach. Yeshiva Shema Ever, I'm Rabbi David Katz. And we are in Parshas Korach, which the article can be read on soulmazel.com. It's called From Gifts Alongside Garam. Questions, comments, or feedback, I can be reached at Rabbi Katz at virtualyeshiva.com. And with that said, let's go ahead and start. There's a lot to be said in this Parsha. As is always the routine, the article is the format of the class. And before we get into the article, know this word, mochen. Mochen means, let's roughly speaking, headspace. Um, I'll give you an example. It's a rough example, a crude one even, but it works. All right, Rambo is the same Mochen as Commando. Okay, if you've seen any of Arnold Schwarzenegger's 80s movies, he just gets a lot of army gear and shoots them up, and Rambo basically does the same thing. And then all the other guys copied suit. Um, 90s music, Pearl Jam and Soundgarden, all that stuff. That's Mochen. The world, the world shares Mochen. Uh, Mochen roughly means mentality, but it means the theme, the concept, the general thread, something that you can reiterate over and over. Uh, nowadays on TV, reality TV show, same Mochen, right? Any show, it's the same thing. The singing shows, same Mochen. Okay, so therefore, to get the Mochen of the Parsha, you have to get into the Haftorah and the Zohar, and you'll find that the three combined, let's say whatever sticks out in the Parsha, the Haftorah and the Zohar, you'll find it has the same Mochen. Once you're in the Mochen, once you're in that zone, once you realize it's a basketball game, it's a football game, it's a singing show that Simon Cowell's on the judge panel, then you can, you're inside. And you can really gain a grasp of the almost everything that's that's involved, all the Torah involved. Here we are in the Parsha's Korach. You open up the cover and you say, okay, what's going on? You got Korach and arguing and the well, you know, the, the ground's going to eat him up. Next thing you know, Aaron is, is personified as the priest. Moses is restored. And a lot of gifts are being given over to the Kohanim. A lot of Cohen law about land, random stuff about animals, you know, uh, the, the firstborn animal, why that's in there. And then the, the parish is over. And you say, well, what was that? What was that? Why is all this together? So that's, it's all random parts. You get into the parish. I just want to explain the thought process behind all this, behind what I do. And you'll see how it works. What I find with the gear is the gear is the concept of a scribe. There's a Gemara in Shabbos that says the sun journeys, right? The sun, whether you believe relativity, whatever you believe, what the Gemara says, the sun journeys the, the universe. And Mercury, right, the planet Mercury, this is, this is one of the arguments about Mazal being in Torah or not. This is one of the, one of the perspectives. Mercury is the personal scribe of the sun's journeys. So if you have a perspective of Mercury, you know everything about the sun in the universe. And this is actually interesting. Uh, a book that I co-authored with Rabbi Glazerson, my part of the research was that Mayans, they worshipped Venus. Because from Venus, and when you take into account Mercury... It gives you a relative, objective view of the universe. Right? Let's say there's an ultimate, objective truth to the universe. You can subjectively get there. Right? Let's say, let's say that Panasonic phones are the, are the fractal of, of reality. <laughs> so you study a Panasonic phone, it gives you the reality of the universe. Well, that's essentially Venus. God made it. So that in nature, if you want to know the numbers and dimensions of any, any mathematical uh, you know, measure, time, weight, distance, 
study Venus and it and it would take you know, and answer the Mercury factor, and it will give you everything you need to know. Now, what the Mayans did was they deified Venus, therefore it will never be lost, right? You you make it your prime object and you'll get sacred knowledge. But that becomes idolatry, and eventually you'll have to serve this, you know, so human sacrifices for your god, which they would do, yada yada yada. The ger is a similar kind of concept within the, the, the text of the Torah. I'm not talking the person, the text. The ger is sprinkled through every parsha. We've shown that now for two years. All right, and we're going to continue showing that until the day this thing, it's not going to stop. That much is clear. So then why is the, what, you know, what is the function of the gear? Don't tell me what's he like and his personality and he's a good guy. And yeah, well, yeah we, know, we know the Hasidus to this. We know that. Hashem loves the gear. We know that too. But the gear's function, right, the Zohar this week talks, don't talk about Meisen Cheshben, meaning don't tell me the blueprint, DNA, the gear comes from this world. Don't, I'm not interested. The Zohar says that the bottom line, you have to do function, action. Do something. And then the Torah comes from the action. So the Ger's function is he is an objective view of the universe. Every Parsha is a universe. When you open up the Parsha's car, boom, hey, argument, Korach, wait, wait, where did that come from? Next week we're going to get into, uh, what is it, Chukas. You know, hey, the Parah Duma, where did that come from? Then we're going into Balak, hey, the daughters of Midian, what, no way, I mean, it's just radical. I mean, Bereshis, you know, Adam, snakes, Cain, destruction. Hey, Noah saved the world. Hey, you know, Abraham, hey, you know, I, I mean, every part is changing. So slow it down. Slow it down to the point of what's called Sadiq Yisod Olam. The righteous is a pillar of the world. Henceforth, the gear it represents righteousness. If you're a gear, it means you have rejected the falsehood of the world. You're observing God's will. You're probably on your way, or at least being a Gerd Sedek. By nature. By nature. So the Ger is this pure aspect. Freeze. Stop. Observe. Look at what's going on around you. So when you function and focus on the Ger of the Parsha, where is he? What's he doing? And maybe there might be a lot of them. So get, get the one that really resonates with you the most. And go to the nth degree of it. Once you have that, that's your DNA strand of Mohin. That's the nature of the reality TV show you're watching. That's the Parsha. In the written Torah, now you can unravel basically everything the oral Torah says from this Parsha. And we know that the Ger is the essence of the oral Torah. Moses commanded... The Gerim Oral Torah of the Amara together. So if you want to see what was the Oral Torah thinking when it came out with this tractate and that tractate. And the Zohar is a portion of the Oral Torah. So what was it thinking? The Zohar when we came out with this and that. Focus on the Ger. Then you'll start to see what's going on. Objectively. All in the orbit of the Parsha. And the Haftorah is focusing on the same thing. Only that... Oh, it's just a Haftorah, it's a little nice reading. No, no, no. This is a selection from the prophets. And one of the things about Mochen, Mochen lends the Mochen. The idea of real Mochen, I mean, not with entertainment. If, if TV were real, you would watch Commando and you would say, okay, I'm ready to be a Navy SEAL now. Or the Navy SEALs would be given Commando for training. So, for example... When you have the prophets, they yield prophetic responses. Study the prophets. Get insight or mochin of prophecy. Why is the Ger called a Kohen Gadol when he learns Torah? Because he becomes a Kohen Gadol. He becomes the property of. He takes on aspects of. So whatever you do in Torah, you become it. It becomes you. This is the idea of, of repairing the vessel. Whatever you make a part of your vessel to the point you have to, you have to properly chew your cud. You have to think about it, digest it, chew on it, 
let it come up again and again, digest it, you understand it, it is a part of you. Really, it's spiritual eating. Then you'll start to get the benefit of whatever it is you're doing. If you're a Parsha person, which we mentioned a couple of weeks ago, about what, what, is, what, is, what is a particular function of the Gare, he lives by the Parsha. That's how the Gare learns Torah by the inscription of God. And it's a much, it's the most accurate way. As we're seeing, every week contains every part of the Torah. Every year, you get all the Torah. Our job is to really refine every day of the year. So if, if every Parsha, we refine it a lot, you get the whole Torah. To the point when you die, hopefully, you will have refined it 120 times. Every one time a year. That's way more and much more systemized than just, hey, today I'm learning this. Hey, hey, let's go learn that. You're jumping everywhere. It's not for the sake of heaven. It's little Shema. Learning Lishma is far greater. So if you're a Parsha person and you learn at Lishma, you get into what? The Mochin every week. You start to see reality and you connect Mochin to Mochin. And you can't help it. So in this week's Parsha, maybe you saw argumentation. Maybe you saw something of the priestly nature. Maybe you wanted to make an offering. Maybe you wanted to give a gift. Maybe you wanted to uh, support the Torah, whatever it is. It starts to resonate in and around you. You see the Torah in life. King David's Psalms. David was answered as he wrote. So when you learn Psalms, if you do it so that you should be answered as you're doing it, it'll happen. Fruit yielding more fruit. The words of the prophets, prophets yielding more prophetic insight. An extension of the prophets because you're putting it in different mochen. You're putting the mochen of the prophet in the Parsha. That's what the Vilna Gon does with his Torah. He takes words of Torah, puts it in proper context, and whoa, look what you have. This is the mazal in the Torah. Rabbis say a lot of things. You know, a person who has arrogance loses his reward in the world to come. Okay, I believe it. That's a nice statement. And then they'll qualify it with Shinemar. That it was said, say in Mishle, in, in Proverbs 1 1. King Solomon said it as uh, uh, a wise man knows not of the frivolous. You know, he'll say something, something far out. When you go look up that Solomon, you'll realize when you look at it in depth, now this Solomon really understood this. And it makes the words of the rabbis seem light and frivolous compared to what Solomon said. Because what's, what the rabbi is doing is he's using Solomon's words in a new context. He says, hey, Solomon says some stuff you probably didn't get. So let me put it easy for you. Bad stuff takes you out of this world, like Solomon said. Now you read Solomon and bad stuff takes you out of this world. You say, whoa, Solomon wasn't kidding. That's where the words become gold of Solomon. And the whole Torah is filled with this. The parsha is just sheep, cow, offer, sanctify, this, oil, Corbin, you know, just random stuff. Put the prophets inside. Bring, bring the prophecy of Samuel electing a king. You say, whoa, how is that from that? And then you start to get the real mochen of the job. Now, what was the mochen I latched on to this week? Pinchas. We're coming up on Parsha's Pinchas soon. Pinchas has land called Givat Pinchas, the hill of Pinchas. The Torah Parsha very clearly says no priest is to have land. Yet we know in the last verse of the book of Joshua, Pinchas buries his father Eleazar in Pinchas's land that Pinchas inherited from his wife who came from the hills of Ephraim. There's a strong reason to think it's Joshua's daughter. Now, how does this all come together? Look into it. A little bit of research. Joshua marries Rachav. They have no sons. They only have daughters. Prophets and priests of the highest caliber come from Joshua and Rachav. As Joshua cannot father sons due to his exalted spiritual level. Rachav is, the, is a character many people don't get into. She's a Gerdsetic, leaning towards the Gerdsetic side versus the convert side. But she's primed after Joshua was there doing outreach work for 40 years ago. And yet before then, Rachel's family was, was, was coming around. So you have the, the, the multiple generations of gear. 
which one of the options of Gerd Sedek is Gerd Sedek Vadai and Gerd Sedek. Either you're a one generational one off, or you're looking to make this your life inheritance. Joshua then it differs from Caleb. Caleb wants to conquer the land with the Noahide laws, but for his own wife, he marries Miriam, who, for her, whatever reason, cannot have kids also. Jo Caleb then has the Gerdsetic Pelegish concubine as his essential uh, offspring deliverance. Joshua chooses right Rachav as numeral uno. Pinchas then comes along, marries their daughter. He's the most prime prophet priest combination. And by doing as such, Pinchas names his kid Avishua, which in Chronicles, Joshua is actually, I know this sounds a little dodgy, but uh, Joshua is called uh, Yeshua in Chronicles. I forget that verse. I can, uh, in email, I can fill that in. One of the verses, Joshua is called Yeshua. Uh, same type of language, salvation. And therefore, Pinchas' son, who became the high priest from Pinchas' legacy, is called Avishua, the father Yeshua. Meaning that the kid inherited spiritually from Joshua because his lineage ended having no sons, passing it on to Pinchas. Pinchas now inherits the wife. Pinchas becomes eternal, an angelic light and soul, living forever from the covenant of peace for killing Zimri and Cosby due to the immorality in the camp of Shimon with the Midianite women. That's going to happen in a couple weeks from now. Pinchas gets the, the, the priesthood, the covenant of, of, of peace. In the name of improper Gerdsedek, Pinchas puts himself to the test, and he delivers, uh, knowing the law, what to do with Rachav, Joshua, and that whole situation. Thereby, Pinchas doesn't die. He inherits his wife. The tribesmen of, of Ephraim agree to give Pinchas land in face of the Torah command, you shall not have land. Yet he was given it, he inherited it, the Torah says, loophole, chiddish, whatever you call it, not a problem, not a chil Hashem. It's very much in line with the Torah when you know the ins and outs of Torah law. Pinchas has land called Givat Pinchas. Elazar, his father, is buried there to this day. Now you see, in the Parsha we find a gear base very, very shrouded amongst law and midrash. You have to find it. But the deeper you look, well, the more Torah on top of it's ready to come inside. Enter the Haftorah. Samuel is a great guy. If there's anybody in the history of the world that had probably no accusations against him, it was probably Samuel. He represents the four craftsmen. He was a judge. He was a prophet. He was priestly. And he was in the aspect of a king. And he anoints the king. So Samuel is your first real body of, let's call it, the Jewish people. He's, you know, the fact that he's the king, he's the Sanhedrin, he sets up shop. First one after coming out of the desert. He actually had his powers of mind from Nada and Aviu, two sons of Aaron that died in the alien fire offering, that were made famous through Pinchas. When Pinchas became Elijah, he received their souls first on an exalted level of Mochen, high intellect. When they, they received their repair through Pinchas, Pinchas went on to become Elijah, and Samuel received the spiritual burst of Nada and Aviu. By those means, he was righteous, and he was right. He was right in everything he did, but he wasn't for the people. He was able, he was so bittle or nullified to God, he gave over the philosophy of Torah that came from Pinchas. And he received from Moses and Joshua and onwards the tradition, Samuel knew what the Torah was about. So much that it was even to his demise. Because the Torah really wants you to have a king. You can call it the evil, the people, whatever it was. The way they came about it might not have been right. But really, the Torah is to have a king. Moses was called a king. The king of Jeshurun. Thereby, once he was able to mishpia that, or to give it over, 
They wanted a king. And Samuel went on to elect a king. This was the essence of the Torah that came from Pinchas. The real Torah that comes from Mazal. This Pinchas acted from Mazal. Pinchas represents all the other kings in history. Whether it be David in the future, Joshua was called a king when he as the, the bearer of the moon attribute or that of Malchus, kingship. Received from the sun, which is another uh, term for Moses. Moses himself then being the king. And the first king of Israel was Shem, who founded the Temple Mount. Those are your basically your five essential kings uh, that came out of this camp. The Torah of Shem is what Pinchas was basing it on. Shem understood that the, the king and the priest are one, whereas Japhet, the other son of Noah, was more about the judge, you know, kind of like a socialism, or the, the, you know, in Israel the corruption is in the judges. So that's how you maintain the corruption in the land. Ham wants everything to be prophecy. Everyone's a prophet, which is an open checkbook to idolatry. Samuel represents the kingdom. The kingdom is the essence of the Torah, which comes from Pinchas. And Pinchas acts on, on the level where he receives the kingdom, the kingdom of being the Messiah, from his knowledge of the law that gets everybody. What is the, the truth to the Ger and Shem in his Torah? I.e. pre-flood, pre-Tower of Babylon, pre-Abraham, pre-Sinai, pre-Desert, pre-Israel. What do you do with all of that? This has been the question that has got everybody. The idolatries came out of it. And we're going to see that Korach is answering or asking the same question. Pinchas happened to have got it right. He was built with the code embedded in his being. So when he has to re-seize the Mazal, which is pure Torah Kabbalah, a parallel to the, the essence of the Ger, of that observation, of watching what happens and watching the pieces come together, that's the Ger, Pinchas masters at bam, action function without without the learning just do it we will do it, we will listen he gets it, God says you are now a priest you are the king messiah essentially therefore he's not the one to bring them into the land Joshua does as Joshua sets up everything for the future Joshua is the, is the instiller of the true message from Moses as both Joshua and Pinchas were youths with Moses. Joshua, one type of scholar, Pinchas another. One of Mochin, one of Mochin the godless. One of intellect, one of high intellect. There must be the basis of intellect for high intellect to function later. Korach, bring it over now to the Zohar. Korach is what's he's, he's mentioned in conjunction with Anshe Shem, men of Shem. I did a name read on, on Korach ben Yitzhar, and you can see what, it, what, it, what what's in his name makes, drives his, uh, his desires. Anshe Shem happens to be the same gematria as Mashiach ben David, when you take the letters in their opposite value. So he's, he's going for the, all the marbles, and all the Achecha are with him, the brothers are with him. Brothers in Talmudic law is a euphemism for Gerim. What Korach is about, he's saying, Shem was a king, Shem was a priest. Moses is a, a priest, but Korach probably isn't really focusing on it. It's a nice little thing, you know, Moses is a priest, but not really. Moses knows that he's part of this Mashiach program with Pinchas, and he's going to be king, part of the king aspect, as prophesied by Jacob at the end of Bereshis. So Moses isn't going to say, you can't say that, Aaron's the not the priest and the Aaron because what Jeff, what Korach is saying is Moses, you're not king. Most Moses go, I am king, I am. No, he's not. It's degrading. So Moses can't talk. He falls on his face. He's laughing. He's embarrassed, and he's probably speaking rabbinically, and he sounds a little stupid because Korach is challenging the rabbis here. He's saying, "Come on, what about the Torah of Shem? 
What are you doing with that? How can you how can you how can you you know go against face with the Torah of Shem? And what are you doing with the Garim? You're not you're not acknowledging anything. There's a time and place, Moses says. But Karak says Aaron's not the not the priest. The priest and the king are one. He's not much of a king. I'm the king. I'm the king, therefore I happen to be a priest. Make me a priest. He's coming with anger. He's saying the base of meat dish. Basically, he's building it with his hands. He doesn't recognize it coming built from heaven. He's, the whole point is, if you're not coming from peace, you're doing it, you know, I'm coming to tell you. I mean, who are you? He's building it from his own volition. He's imposing his will, and he's saying, I understand. You don't understand the Torah of Shem. And, I mean, that, we see that with all every religious, false religion does the same thing. And this is the, this is the same sin of Cain. Bad understanding. Bad understanding leads to bad actions. Cain says to Abel, Abel, you know, you're, you're laughing at me for my offering not being accepted. Did you offer everything you could? You could have offered a, a donkey, as the Parsha says. A firstborn donkey, if you don't redeem him, you break his neck. I think you're a donkey. I'm breaking your neck. Bad move. Maybe his Yitzhah Hara had the muzzle of a donkey, but you don't break the guy's neck. It's a very simple thing. Don't kill so, you know, Cain jumps to conclusions and breaks cardinal rule number one. Korah comes along and says, hey, what about Shem? And what about the Torah of Shem and all this? And he makes argument over it. Shem's Torah is about peace. It's about real, real mastery, rabbi, real rabbi, real mastery of law. Korah goes in face of that. There's a very poor understanding. You don't just jump and say, ah, I figured it out. We're Jews for all of, what, a week? All of a sudden you figured it out? Let the time develop. So he does everything in the opposite. In fact, he's an exact opposite of Pinchas, which is ironic. As Korach wants to undermine Moses and bring in Shem, right, through arguing and anger and I'm busting my way in, and they say no, and he dies. He represents the idea of God is in the earth. You know, God moved me. God made me do it. Well, God then says, here, I'll open the earth and kill you. I mean, modern Zionism is founded the same way. We're watching what the earth does as if, like, the tectonic plates, people moving, is, is God in motion. Kind of, but it's bad Kabbalah. We know that God puts names in the land, but the names of the people are connected to God, not, not the actual, you know, people moving on the land. It's the people devoid of the land. God puts the people in the land. That's God's divine providence, where you are. But you have to make a separation. You can't call that God. Therefore, God swallows Korach in the land. And so there, eat some of your own medicine. Now the irony is, Pentecost does bust his way in, and he does kill, and he is given the priesthood, and he is given the kingship eventually. How does that work? The irony is, Pentecost had to receive from above. God showed him the mazal. Pentecost jumped by God's command. And Pinchas did create peace. When he acted, it was over. There was no more controversy. It's like, you know, firing shots of bullets in the air, saying, okay, let's calm down, boys. And you'll get calm real quick. So for that, Pinchas made peace. Korach made the opposite of peace. He made such a schism that he still exists today. The Torah of Shem remains taboo until this day. Only Pinchas has the, really the ability to bring a full repair. And that's the revelation of Elijah. That's what was given to David. That's what Moses was getting on. The essence of the Torah is that message of Pinchas. And it will be fulfilled when Pinchas' soul is, you know, the sparks and the Kabbalah, everything given over till it's repaired. What is the status of Shem, of Geram and Law? So is it, is, it any, is it any surprise that the Garam are not dealt with by rabbis today? We don't go there. Every tragedy in history was because of this. Some are called heretics in history because of it. Korah got killed over it. It's a fine line. But we must be willing to take on that mission. Just because it got people in trouble doesn't mean you don't go there. But we can understand why it was buried. It is seen as the quintessential argument point or piece to the board. Korach hit it up more than anybody. 
Now we see the elements of now into the Parsha article. The Torah, oral Torah is all through the Parsha. And when you understand now the land, Penchis, the ideas of land, where it comes from, inheritance, and you start to look at where it says about the firstborn animal being redeemed, you start to see this is really oral Torah stuff. You get into Korach and you get the gear. You say, wait a minute, I know this. This sounds like the Talmudic tractate Bava, which literally means gate or in terms of damages. First gate, middle gate, last gate. Bava Kama, Bava Metzia, Bava Basra. And Bava Kama is all of Mishpatim. For those of you that heard class on Wednesday, the all the statutes that come inside Noahide law. Bava Metzia is about argument. I found a Talos, I found a Talos. It's mine, it's mine. I found it, I found it. We argue. We all both take, take an oath in case one person has an evil inclination that's operative and we're lying. We swear to prevent that and we split it. Korach 101. Right? You guys got Torah. I have Torah. Let's split it. Hey. Baba Basra, the concept of inheritance and inheritance of the land. The daughters of Slavka that wanted to receive their portion. In Parshas Pinchas. Then we, we find that in regards to the Pinnacles, there's a lot of oral Torah, a lot of Torah in general. But in this Parsha, we find the essence of Bava. And when you take out superfluous tractates of oral Torah, you find that there are 53 tractates corresponding to 53 Parshios. Whether or not that's exactly right, I'm not sure. It, you know, Alpi Drush, it probably is. Is it the ultimate answer? There's probably other answers. The point being, we're seeing the Mochen. When Rabbi, Rabbi Judah Nasi sits down to write the Oral Torah, there's a thought pattern. He knows how from Kabbalah to look in the Parsha and say, hey, look at Parsha's Pinchas. That looks like Bava to me. Or Parsha's Korach. Let's look at Parsha's Noach. That looks like uh, retracting this or this. And you start to see the Mochen of the Parsha yields the real Torah. But it's not Tovavo. It's not chaos and void. Look for the Ger. The Ger in the Parsha will tell you the Mochen. In fact, it's known what is a, a Seichel or Mochen is called a Ger in this world. Because it's alien to this world. People don't think in this world. So how does thought come into the world? The Ger in this world represents thought. It's not man's natural ability to think. So if you want to think what is the Torah thinking, stand in the place of the ger and you will be in Torah thought. That's the reality. So when you want to know what is the Parsha, see it from the viewpoint of the ger. That's how you have all of Bava in the Parsha. Look for the Kohen Gadol. The Kohen Gadol is the easy answer. If you want to, the gear, looking for the gear in that respect is easy. A gear in one store is like a Kohen Gadol. Yes, we know that. We mention it every week. And it's a starting point. But take it really deep. Pinchas the Kohen Gadol with Joshua and Rachav. And, he's in, and he gets land from Joshua and Rachav. He becomes the Kohen Gadol forever because of it. And Avishua's kid inherits it. Pinchas goes back to Aaron. Aaron argues with Korach. That's how you get a lot of Torah to come out at one time. Whereas if you just say, Kohen Gadol, okay, then you give a lot of nice little ideas, and it's fine. But the Mochin must go deep. As deep as you can go to bring in all the realm of Torah you know to get that crystallization, to be able to extract the most intellect from the Torah, or light in that respect. And there's, there's another aspect now that we understand Pinchas, the Kohen, the Ger, this and that, there's, an, I, there's this the saying in the Torah, the firstborn animal of an impure animal you, you redeem. And Bava Kama, or Bava Metziah, talks about it in, in a law issue about if the, you, you grab the animal before you give it, whose animal is it, do you have to give it to the priest or not? I was thinking then, how does this relate to Pinchas and his repair of Cain? Cain says to Abel, as we said, you know, you didn't do a good job. I'm going to kill you. What was Cain really to say? And why wasn't Cain's offering attended to? Cain didn't know how to give an offering himself. He had the idea. He really deep down did know. 
But he jumped the gun. Remember, bad understanding jumps the gun. If he says, I'm the firstborn here, and it's my idea, so I understand this, and I think you know, he copied off of me, and I'm going to be the bigger guy. I'm going to do kindness with him, Sadaka. I'm going to show him how to do it right. Hey, brother, come over here. You want to give a Corbin Ola? You know, let's do it. You're the one with the animals, not me. Let's, let me show you how to do it. If Cain lends his services, the, the Torah that comes out of it, like Elisha and Naaman, he himself will know how to give his offering. God will take it. Nobody died. Everyone's happy. In fact, Elisha's name means, to me, he turned. Elisha does the repair of Cain, hands it over to Pinchas. Pinchas is the rectification of Cain. That is the level of the Messiah. How does that relate to Pinchas? Pinchas basically is the Corbin. <laughs> when he jumps out to kill Zimri and Cosby, he's a goner. He has every reason to be killed. But he lives on, and that knowledge gives the impure thoughts become pure. Want to find your paraduma, Red Heifer? Look to Pinchas. In fact, Pinchas Eliyahu, initial letters, pay all of the same as paraduma, Red Heifer. You want to say that the it's the, the learning of Pinchas is the mice of the Cheshbin, the learning of the Paraduma? Then where's the function of the tenth Paraduma offered by Mashiach? Pinchas himself. And the, the, the word Korban means to bring together. Nobody watches it come together and brings it more together than Pinchas. Onward we go. The spies. Spies are Joshua and Caleb. The spy, other spies want to use weapons of war. The letter Zion is an implement of war. The Sulam says you cannot use the Zion as an implement of war, i.e. number seven, because every Shabbos follows suit with a oncoming weekday. It's not a complete repair. So therefore you can't identify Malchus or sevens by seven as the end level, which is why we have eight as infinite. Caleb says, I'm going to go to the forefathers, connect to the Gerd Sedek, and that's how you're going to conquer Israel. And he does. And it's partially conquered. He gets, he gets Hebron. He gets more land than probably anybody in terms of conquering. But he, he chooses Israel as his bride, which is understandable. Joshua says, I'm living this out. This is the truth. I know the law. He goes in with words of Torah. And we know that the messianic days or the world is conquered not with with weapons of war. Hodva Hadar, glory and majesty, used to be weapons of war, are now words of Torah. Weapons are vanquished in those days, says the prophecy. The world stops with the seven laws of Noah. A Moloch has even conquered seven laws of Noah. Joshua says that is the truth. Jericho is conquered by Joshua. It's a rebound and safe for Joshua. The Torah is implemented. He goes with Rachav. And when he goes in with Rachav, he sends Pinchas and Caleb now to be the new spies to secure Jericho for Israel's entrance into the land. Once there, Pinchas plays Shachan, or matchmaker, finally puts together Rachav and Joshua. A long story coming over 40 years. Caleb then is where he finds... Now, Caleb's in with that, with that crowd as well. That's his mazal. And Pinchas now meets the family of who's going to be his in-laws. The whole story now comes into focus. Joshua was Hosea. Hosea was about having the uh, zone of a wife. Right? So Moses uh, keeps that from happening. Don't fall victim to the Shimon legacy of, of getting somebody impure, a non geared Sedek. Moses gives him a Yud, Yehoshua, which is the tribal head of Levi, coming inside Joshua. Jo Ephraim and Levi are now brothers, basically. Pinchas inherits, who's a Levi, inherits from Joshua. Ephraim, Pinchas goes back to, Josh, to Joseph on himself, from his mother's side. Joshua has no sons. Pinchas marries Joshua's daughter from Rachav. And Mashiach ben Ephraim, the Joseph Messiah who ended with Joshua, is spiritually conferred to Pinchas. Givat Pinchas, the son of his son, is the same gematria. Mashiach ben Ephraim 
and Mashiach ben David in Atbash. Opposite letters. Pinchas inherits everything spiritual gift of the firstborn from Joshua, Ephraim, Joseph. As part of the level he inherited, the, the mazal of it at the covenant of peace. All that's left is for Pinchas to merge with Judah. Judah gives over to Benjamin. And Benjamin and the priests have a common bond through the secret union of Purim and Hanukkah. Which is the time of the Garam. Right, here we go. Since the war is not won with implementations of war, where does David go wrong? Where does David go wrong in the war? He conquers Syria with weapons of war, not with seven laws. David doesn't build the temple. Solomon builds it. Can it be a building of peace? David figures out the ways of peace at the end of his life after it was already decreed no. But David did enough that Shem, while he said it, confers upon him the priesthood. Tehillim number 110, David, to you, you are a priest forever, by my word, Malki Tzedek. You now have Pinchas who broke in, David breaks in. In fact, the Torah says the sons of David are priests. Moses becomes a priest, and that is your messianic flavor. David, Moses, Pinchas. The vessel, the vessel to the vessel, and the soul, David himself. The Talmud talks about Joshua and Rachav. And about the implementations of war, the old war didn't have, it wasn't necessarily bows and arrows. It didn't have to be ninjas, and they talk about on YouTube and all the fighting techniques of warriors. The real warriors, David was called a man of war in the Oral Torah. When you understand Oral Torah, you are called a man of war. By the way, man of war is the same Gematria Mashiach and David, also that of friendship. The covenant must be a covenant of peace. Peace must be shalom bias. Right? The learning technique is the covenant of peace. When you implement peace, when you make peace, the verb, make peace. When you bring peace to the home, spread it in the world, that's a verb. Nobody was greater at making peace than Pinchas. That came from Joshua and Rachav, made peace, brought the two sides together. And the whole thing was, to, was brought about by love and peace and not implementations of war. Had all the, all the people involved fought war, the world basically would have been destroyed. That was the severity of the, of the ten other tribes. That is what Korach was going back to. And we say, make love, not war. Korach said, make war, not peace. What's interesting about the Gare is the gear is the essence of Kabbalah. If it just is. There's no, you know, wow, you can learn the gear out from Kabbalah. No, 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 no. We say the gear of the Torah is the oral Torah. On a deeper level, where is the Kabbalah in Torah? The gear. That's what a gear is. He is the Kabbalah in the Torah. On, a, on the level of the Torah of Jacob. Meaning you don't need the Torah Israel and meditate and names of angels and worlds. That's nice. And it exists. On the Torah Israel. But the universal Torah, the Torah of, Ju of Jacob, which is synonymous really with the Torah of Shem. The Ger is the Kabbalah. So it yields very easily. Pinchas then is the essential Ger. He is a soul spark of Jethro and Joseph. Joseph was the most Jewish Ger ever. To the point of not becoming Jewish, didn't want to become Jewish. Jethro also, he could have been Jewish in two seconds. Stay at Sinai, you're Jewish. He leaves. The Kabbalah is that that the message comes from the Ger. The message is Kabbalistic. Pinchas is the inheritor of that code. He has the most essential Ger code in him, to the point that he acts as such by nature.
Pinchas is going to marry the daughter of Joshua and Rachav. He kills Zimri and Cosby. If anybody has to walk the path of the, the, the zone Torah, it's Pinchas. Right? He, he defends God's honor through the gear, the, the, in the, the perversion of it. And he has to, he's asked to walk it at the same time with Rachav. That's where Moses folded with Sapporah in terms of Zimri and Cosby. Pinchas walks it. He steps up to the plate. Korah was stepped up to the plate too, but he comes up with his fists up saying, hey, let's box. Pinchas just walks up with a spear. But not in the whole thing like, you mess with me, I'll get you with a spear. No, 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 no. He does it in the name of God. There's no verbal, there's no threat, there's no intimidation, there's no macho anything. It's simply God told him to do it, so he did it. But he had the prophecy really that comes from wisdom. Such a wisdom that it really is watching the colors of creation of reality in Mazal formulate the word of God. What's interesting is that when Pinchas gets the land as the, as the result of such efforts, the halacha is by Pinchas. They say the halach is always like David. David had the Kabbalah of Pinchas. David mastered the, the, the Torah, the halacha, the Kabbalah, all of Mazal. And that really is the message that was given from Pinchas, such that David even inherited the same nod of an avio that comes in Samuel and Pinchas. David inherited as well. The revelation is is that Pinchas kind of is a natural Torah. The Torah was, the blueprint is Pinchas. If there's a blueprint that God looked at, we know that God had a blueprint. The Torah is the craftsmanship, Uman. We know about the four craftsmen. Messiah's sons of David, Joseph, Elijah, and Shem. The blueprint to those four is the Pinchas program. God molds the Torah in this thing called the Pinchas program. We know there are 613 parts of the body corresponding to the mitzvahs. That's the Pinchas program. Or you can look at it as the seven attributes. That's the Pinchas program. So the Pinchas has the Torah with him, and he knows the halacha. Whether it be the inheritance law, that he, that he walks the same path, the, the Kohen having land. Everybody says, oh, come on. A priest can't have land. David would bring about it. They would laugh at him. Pinnacles does it. And they say, oh, Pinnacles knows. How about inheritance? Pinnacles knows. It's coming from him. Where did he get the idea of becoming a priest? Nobody can become a priest if you're not a priest. Pinnacles did. Oh, well, I guess there's a precedent for that. So whenever there's an idea from a sealist the upper world that comes into our world, we say, oh, that's without precedent. That's wrong. Let's laugh at it. Or Korak says, let's steal it. How about that? It's better off to steal it. Pinnacle says, no, you don't steal it. If you do it the right way, you'll get it. All the things that are not known that we laugh at, Pinchas has the ability to know it. What Pinchas represents is the true Kiddush to the Torah. True revelation to true insight, true things that you really have to know the depth and, and full bodiness of Torah to grasp. All the Torah knowledge comes inside to gain the true Kiddush. We talked before about when the, when the Kiddush is worked on and worked on, it comes into the world and then other people can get it. A true Torah revelation. Pinchas is the master of revelation. Because he has the, all the tools of Torah through the craftsmanship to be able to grasp the Kiddush. So when it comes down to Rachav and Joshua marrying, Pinnacle says, not a problem. I know that program. When, you have, when Pinnacle has to walk that same path, not a program. Life is this Pinnacle's, the Cohen program. We know that there's the Kohen, the teacher, the teacher of righteousness in that world 
who teaches righteousness called the Rosh Yeshiva in the spiritual world. And when that teacher of righteousness reads from the, the scroll of the congregation, that's called the Messiah program, says the Zohar. But where it comes from is that scroll, what that teacher is observing. He's observing the life of Pinchas. And Pinchas then is that which is written about. As it all comes from him, and that's why he knows these laws. So only Pinchas walks that path, whereas Korach wants to fabricate those laws. Korach wants to come and say, maybe the Torah is written about me. Maybe I'm the real priest. Maybe I know the Torah of Shem. Maybe I'm the real king. Maybe I'm the high priest. And he wants to come in and say, you know, I'm choosing myself. God agrees. Pentecost says, come on, man, it comes from God. You can't just say, I am. I think I am. That's what real Vodazar idolatry is. I just know. I say such and such. I just know. Pentecost just knows because God tells him. Korah comes in arguing with double barrel shotgun. I am. Well, if there's an I in the very beginning, it's wrong automatically. Korah shows us the wrong life. King Solomon's teaching you how to not be a Korach. The Torah is teaching you what is a Pinchas. And they really go hand in glove, as Solomon was charged with writing the essence of the Torah. He's telling you, stop being a Korach. Inside the don't be a Korach, you'll find the I, you know, how how to how to how to be the I am the Pinchas program. We can all be like Pinchas when we learn how to not be a Korach. Pinchas is the salvation of the Torah. The Torah winning. We know that in the end of days there's Gog, the, the leader of the nations who wants to undermine the Torah, the extension of Japheth who says, we're all judges in socialism, communism, let's call it the New World Order, right? There's no Torah, just libertarianism and paternalism is the new, the new uh, catchphrase. And they're putting it into, into effect. The judges make sure it happens. We are the governing body. You are a, 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 a rat in a cage. The Torah comes to say, how about free will? The Torah says, Pinchas understood the pathways of free will. Once one person can get out, and he did, nothing else will ever be able to keep that down. The Messiah program is inevitable. The Brisk Rav actually says, why was Pinchas chosen to be the bearer of the Messianic mission? He restores the Torah, just as he restored the Torah then. And Moses didn't, wasn't able to stand up and speak. Pinchas then will be the one in the end of days that re restores the Torah, leading the way of the, re of the resurrection of the dead. On every level. And the Zohar says, in the end, when the resurrection happens towards the Messianic conclusion... All the bad people are going to come back. All the Greisers Aachen are going to come back. And in that time, the Garen will come back too. And the righteous will be, will, be, will be granted with the powers of heaven being bestowed upon them. And the wicked will be given all of the bad guys. Samach Mem, Angel of Death, Shindalids. The bad will get worse, the better will get better. We come into the land. The land is the opposite of a Vodazar, the real land. Rather than saying God is God is the land. That's modern Avodazar of, of the Zionists. The Tarmadoi, Erevrav, Amalekite says God is locked out. He's he's beyond. He has no more uh, cooperation with this world. We just what that is, that's modified with the Korach program. God doesn't get involved in our lives, he wrote us off. He lets us do what we want if we're good. And I'm pretty good. As long as I'm not Korach. Right? If I'm Korach, God will make, make the ground swallow me. As long as I'm not that bad, I'm probably okay. In fact, I can probably be whatever I want to do. That's another Avodah The real non avodazara is God is king of the earth. He's everywhere. He's everything. God is not the land. What God does is God gives the land. The land belongs to God. 
God puts people in lands. God cooperates with people in lands through their names. He gave Israel the land of Israel so that they should be there as Garim to God and be a nation whose flagship mission is a light to the nations loving the Garim. From that, that universal view, objective and, 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 and relative, from standing in a neutral position, looking at the world, being able to see what's going on. Governed from a Torah reality led by Mashiach Pinchas. Or at least the Torah of. Knowing what to do from the perspective of a real four craftsman. The king, the prophet, the priest, and the judge. No idolatry will come out of that. Intellect will rule, and the Torah will be understood on its deepest levels. Every, for this to work, there must be a gear. Once you eliminate the gear, it's over. There's no neutral view. There's no objective view. You will pervert society. You'll make a Tower of Babylon. We're all equal. We're not all equal. The equality doesn't mean better or worse. Gear in this most basic definition, I'm not you and you're not me, that's called Kruvim, angelic opposites. If I stand in your shoes, I can see everything I didn't see if you stand in mine. But don't judge me. The point is standing there with open mind, hey, let me see your point of view. I think they call it brotherhood. In fact, Matat and Sandal are brothers on that premise alone. It's called friendship, it's called brotherhood, it's called let me see your point of view. Your world's not mine. That is reality. And some people have mazel circles where the worlds are similar. And there's bigger groups that are similar. And so there's two nations. Let's say a Jewish nation and a Gare nation. Similar must learn the point of view of the other. Let's say in the land of Israel and out of the land of Israel. And then there's Garim, the Gare Toshav in the land, where the Gare Toshav is commanded to be in the land. There's always a Gare component. Once you eliminate him, you're out of the Mochin of Torah. Once there is a gear program, you get everything. And it comes from the ultimate gear, God. God is holy. Holy means not with us. But yet he is with us. God is one. That's the mistake. To think God is either here or not here. He's the, he's the ultimate gear, and that he's here is the ultimate gear, that he's not here, and it's not a contradiction. That comes from the world of Kabbalah. Kabbalah, there's the highest level, lowest level, and there's no equality. Because where there's the, the highest level closest to God, flip it around, and guess where God's the most relevant? In the temple in this lowly world. The, up, the menorah facing up and the menorah facing down. There is no right or wrong, good, bad, or, right, or you know, better or worse when it comes to God. There simply is, you are you, I am me, they're there, we're here. Everyone's a little different. Everybody's a gear. Everyone is in perspective or a position to see a perspective of everybody else if you follow that true spot or point of righteousness, the Messiah point. Try your best to stand there. And we're given the tools to identify it. Stand there and look around and you'll see who's who. And it's all one Torah, everybody's involved. The Torah given to mankind. That is when the, the Midrash says, the Messiah comes not for the scholarship of Israel, but for the scholarship to be given and delivered and taught and expounded to the Garen. With that point, I'll rest my case. Have a great week. And see everybody on Wednesday. Next week we come back for Parshish Chukas. Uh, questions, comments, or feedback can be reached at Rabbi Katz at virtualyeshiva.com. Hope you enjoyed. See you next time. Have a great week.